exploration and mining done the right way is a win-win for all. That is a key message from William Witham, the chief executive of the Australian African Mining and Energy Group. I interviewed William Witham at the AMEG head office in Perth, where he told me the opportunities and challenges inherent in the industry and how the benefits can be shared by all. First, William told me how his journey in life led him up to the point of becoming the chief executive of AMEG. I have quite a, a varied background. Originally, uh, I was from a farm in, in Western Australia, but I went to university and did, did geology, and from there went into exploration. Um, and one of my first jobs was actually living in Africa. I was based in uh, Cape Town, working for a company that did airborne surveys all over Africa. Uh, that was in the 90s, the mid-90s. And then uh, later on in the mid to late 2000s, I, uh, I was in pegging ground and, and doing exploration throughout Africa. So I had quite an association with Africa. And then, uh, but in 2013, I decided to run for election in the federal election in, West, in Australia. And uh, I just missed out being elected, but I was much <coughs> very interested by the electrical process the electoral process and uh, after that I was offered a job with the Chamber of Minerals and Energy in Western Australia uh, where I learnt a lot more about you know the advocacy behind the scenes and how government works in some areas uh, and then this job came up so I had that background of being in exploration I've been running exploration companies and also working with government and government relations so it was a good blend and I think for this job you need to have uh, access to all those areas. Yeah, so how long have you been in the job now? I've uh, been with AMEG since January last year, so coming up to 20 months, 21 months. So, yeah, it's been a great, great experience. Uh, the first year, you really, you, you don't know what you're doing so much. You're learning a lot. Uh, it's, you know, we've grown very rapidly. We've had a big increase in membership. Um, but now it's really more around consolidation and you know, working for our members and working on a lot of those policy areas and issues that our members want us to focus on. So when you got into the job, what did you learn seeing that it's possible not to know very well what you're doing in your first year? Ah, uh, yeah, I shouldn't say you don't know what you're doing, but you're, you're meeting everyone for the first time. You're, you're meeting all the, the stakeholders and the members. And uh, in a way, I, I think that it was important my experience with the Chamber of Mines was very good because I understood how um, to approach governments, um, how advocacy is done and, and how you need to participate. But also, I also understood the problems that, that our companies, mining companies have um, and, and things they need to learn. And, and from that, uh, that first year, you could quickly see um, things that you could help change and things that were a bit more difficult. Um, so certainly, uh, some of the, the issues are reoccurring, um, but I think over over time you will see gradual improvements in those areas. And given how long you've been uh, the uh, the boss, you know how, how how long you've led AMEG. Now you can tell me what AMEG is really all about. Uh, AMEG is a, lots of different things to different people. It really is. In, in some ways, it's a bit of a family and a bit of a club where people come together and share their experiences, meet new people. Uh, obviously all having in common the, the fact that you know people are working in Africa um, but based generally here in, in Western Australia or Australia. So it's, it's that, so that's the connection side. We have a lot of seminars and just networking events which people enjoy. Um, but beyond that it's also, it's an effective lobby, lobbying organisation. It's, it's seen uh, as uh, a voice for the industry um, and it's very important you know, when you approach governments that you go with a collective voice. So that advocacy part of AMEG is, is very important and some of the experience and directors of AMEG who have been around a long time, um, their opinion carries quite a lot of weight with governments. And thirdly, uh, it's really a bit of a think tank. So we also have quite a few academics, you know, we have close association with universities, um, uh, PhD people, um, which is interesting in terms of the way of thinking forward of how we can uh, you know do things better and how the world's changing so that's also very important so AMEG is, is quite a varied thing to many many people um, and sometimes it's just a marketing tool for certain you know we, we do have some members that are service providers and maybe they look at it quite from a commercial aspect 
Um, but that's really not the main focus. The main focus is to provide that, that strong sort of policy support to, to mining and exploration companies and help them operate successfully in Africa. What's your current membership like? It's quite varied. I mean, we have over 100 members now. A third would be mining and exploration companies. I think a, a third would be directly service companies related to mining. And the other third would be probably more around companies that are involved with, you know, as I said, educational institutions, uh, NGOs, uh, people working in community development programs. So that, that's, that's roughly the mix of the, the membership. It's about a decade now since AMEC has been operating. Uh, what do you think was the terrain like for, for members before AMEC came into being? Uh, well, I was around, I guess, when AMEC started. I was actually uh, CEO of a exploration company in Congo, Brazzaville. It was, I think, quite a, you know, there was a community around. Everyone tended to know each other quite well, but there was no formal arrangement. and. I think it was a really uh, good thing to start because there were some people that had had experience and could help teach others, um, you know, not to make the same mistakes they'd made and also to tell the good stories that had been, you know, that were coming out of Africa about a lot of the fantastic socio-economic development that was occurring um, around with, with sustainable development. So in some ways it really has helped bring, bring the industry together and have a united voice. and. I think it's been really important, especially through the tough times. Uh, I think 2013 to 2015 was very tough for the industry, very hard to raise money. Uh, but when times are good, it's also very important to to stick together and um, you know together we have a much stronger voice than as as individuals. I was looking at the A Make Chatter, and it's surprisingly short and quite focused on what it is supposed to be. What have you discovered in terms of what AMEC wants to achieve in, in your role over the past um, 18 months or so? Uh, I think that you know, the Charter is very important and I guess it has a focus on um, you know, operating in Africa and being good corporate citizens and, um, and understanding the latest developments around human rights and security and those types of issues. Uh, I think that the Charter is but I think we could broaden it out. It is surprisingly short, and I think there's so many different aspects to working in Africa that, um, and we need to look at all of those. If we concentrate too much in one area, um, then we might be missing out on something else. And at the end of the day, you know, our our mission is to help companies operate successfully in Africa. And sometimes that focus might be on legal and tax issues. Other times it might be on social issues or political issues. They're all very important. So, but of course, a short chatter doesn't mean ineffective charter and I'm thinking the Constitution of the United States it is famously small but then a lot is derived out of it so I was rather impressed reading it and seeing how you implement uh, the, the the objectives how do you implement the objectives for the benefit of, of AMEC members that's a good question I mean we've just carried out a strategic planning session with the board um, and we have a an action plan and putting that in place and it, and it does focus on all those different areas um, that I've mentioned before so it's part of its education of our members, um, attaining new members um, and probably also one of the harder things is that general uh, reputation of the industry. I think that where we need to get a bit smarter and collaborate with is in terms of telling those good stories. There's a lot of anti-mining sentiment out there and certainly for us what we want is for uh, the general public, both here in Australia and in Africa and elsewhere for that matter, um, understand that good, you know, mining done the right way and sustainably and where there's a fair return for the people who own the resources and for the companies that do the, the exploration, um, that is a way forward. Uh, and so, yeah, the, I think in terms of the, the, the smaller groups we deal with, the direct one-to-one -one meetings were quite effective. but. Also part of our, our charter should be to look at the broader um, issues and, and that sort of more um, advertising type campaign, if you like, or issues campaign, which we're seeing now in Australia. Um, we're probably going away from more the quiet advocacy, more to um, helping influence uh, general public opinion. And, and you have had 
quite an African experience. You've been to quite a few countries in Africa and, and worked there as well. How has that informed you in your comprehension of the issues and how they can be addressed? Uh, that's a good, good question. I think each country is different. You know, there's certainly, first of all, Africa is, you know, 54 countries or so. So uh, I do feel that each country does have its own issues and you can't treat it as one, one country. Well, some people think of it as a whole, as one place, but obviously it's lots of different places. But being there certainly gives you a huge appreciation for the issues on the ground. I think really... One of the things that it's very hard to get your head around if you if you live in such a place as Western Australia, which is quite westernised and um, not really having that many problems, um, and then going to Africa and seeing all the challenges there, I think it's really important to go over there because it's quite easy to be um, isolated and insulated from those issues if you spend too much time away. So um, it's really important to be on the ground and to travel to those countries to understand what you know, those countries are going through. And that includes the government of those countries, and that includes the people in the civil society and the people that may be living around the mine sites. And you cannot get an appreciation from that from, from, you know, looking from Australia. An interesting point you just made, the fact that, you know, Africa is, is very diverse, you know, more than 50 countries. And when I attended your uh, seminar, uh, Investing in Africa seminar between you and Lavin, uh, one of the participants actually made that specific point. I've been involved in Africa for 20 years and uh, and there's no such thing as sort of knowing Africa. You know you know, one or 20 of the 50 countries that are, make up Africa. What he says is important that, you know, it's almost impossible to understand Africa, you know, in its entirety because of all of these different uh, cont countries. But still, how does your personal understanding of the number of countries you've uh, you've been helps you in this role? Uh, well I think just understanding that there are different geopolitical tensions as you as you move around Africa and um, you know part of that cultural understanding is important so if you're if you're wanting to have success in a certain area um, you need to understand the, the drivers of it so for example we're sponsoring uh, I just sent out something today, a, you know, a geopolitical talk at U, UWA on Mauritania and the history of Mauritania and the area surrounding that. We have a lot of members moving into Mauritania, Senegal and that, type, that West Africa area. Um, and most of our members realise now that to operate successfully, even before you go in or when you first start your projects, it's really important to understand all the drivers around that, that area and, uh, and, and the cultural things that are needed. Um, I'll just give a very quick example here, which is probably, I'm not trying to single any country out, but Mauritania, for example, does have a history of slavery. And there's um, a modern history of slavery, if you like, where there is a whole set of people that were basically slaves to, to the other people in Mauritania. Now, that understanding that and the history of that and how that's being unwound is, is really important to understand in even today when you're out working in Mauritania. So, that's the sort of detail that you need to be in, in one country. Um, but then we go down to a country like uh, Cote d'Ivoire, which you know had recently, uh, you know, ten years ago or so, had some unrest and it was sort of, um, you know, president ousted and general elections. You need to understand the context that you're working in in that environment. Um, and one of the things we, we do try and do is, is empower our members to understand the cultural differences and 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 you know it is there are different cultures there and what are the drivers of behavior there so for example we just co-hosted with um the australian government in accra uh, a conference on security in west africa and the drivers of why uh, the kidnappings are occurring or if there's unrest and you know some countries we are seeing increased issues in mali and burkina faso places like that so we are keen to understand the drivers of that behaviour and see what we can do and influence in reducing reducing those incidents. And mining, energy, uh, exploration, these are all areas that is supposed to be a win-win situation for all because you did mention not so long ago that um, mining is actually good for all, you know, when you take the whole picture. And yet, it has the tendency or, or the propensity to generate a lot of misunderstanding how is that so? Yeah, there's a lot of drivers. I think what you're seeing today in social media and mainstream media is around 
um, you know, there seems to be some uh, quite a lot of negativity around mining and what you often hear about Africa is well uh, you know it's resource rich but it's poor and you know, it's been over 100 120 years of mining in Africa and some countries haven't got a lot to show for it and you know that's that's a valid argument you look at it um, and then you have to drill down why that has been and I, I we very much believe in the win-win and we show examples of where Australians have been mining and you know the fantastic programs that they've had and the developments they've had in that area have been good and long-lasting and effective um, that general rhetoric coming out saying well you know things aren't fair or there hasn't been a good enough um, I guess a sharing of the profits between the country and the company maybe that has been the case in the past uh, I think people and companies are much more tuned in now to saying well what is a fair take you have to of course for a company to go in and explore and develop a mine there's a certain risk so they balance that risk and part of that is understanding what they would make out of it and then what is a fair take for the government and I think as we've seen a lot in the past unrest around where it hasn't been fair or it has been seen as inequitable and that has resulted in in tensions political tensions um, and resulted in loss of mines, nationalisation, that type of thing. I think if we, as we go into the future, we'll see a lot more sophistication. I think we'll see companies uh, negotiating fairly with governments, um, having the agreements ratified by those governments, and then understanding that every, you know, there must be uh, something in it for everybody. It must be win-win. And uh, as we go forward, I think you'll see the African mining industry develop and mature. Uh, you'll see countries with uh, stronger middle classes, more um, skills within those countries, and probably, you know, money, you, you still will have Australian-based companies, but those Australian-based companies maybe have subsidiaries in other countries, which will have subsidiaries in, in African countries, and they will partner with local companies. So we're, we're seeing the world, you know, the globalisation is still occurring. Um, and that's one of the interesting things, you know, what is, what is an Australian company? You know, quite often now you have an Australian company, but the shareholders will be from all over the world. They'll be operating in lots of countries and they'll it's have subsidiaries. Yes, yes. So uh, I think that's where we're heading. And I think, you know, Africa does have great geology. Many of the countries are really well endowed with minerals. And um, I think that's an opportunity for those countries. But it needs to be done in a sustainable way, in a way that there's, you know, benefits the, the people of the country. I think you've kind of touched on it a little bit in terms of the benefits of mining to the host countries, but I wonder if you can give a little bit more details. What can you say to show that mining for the host countries is actually good or can be good in terms of promoting business, uh, employment, and so on and so forth? There's a lot of areas that mining can, can help. I mean, if you look at the small, you know, smaller population countries, you look at, um, say, Namibia and Botswana and Zambia, for example, they really were built, uh, you know, you have good road infrastructure, you have a good health system, um, you know, the, the royalties from mining have helped pay basically, you know, for a lot of the government expenditure and taxation, etc. cetera. Um, and that's really where you, need, where you need to focus, where if you have good, you know, successful mines, I think Ghana would be another country, you could probably argue there's a lot of development in Ghana that's been caused or as a result of the mining industry there. Um, so yeah, I think we need to pull out those examples. Where I think it, it goes wrong sometimes is you, you go to some countries where mining has been carried out by um, people that, that haven't been environmentally conscious, have, have not had good employment principles, um, haven't declared all their materials. Maybe they've been shipping it out without declaring all their, all their minerals. Um, and maybe they're paying off people in the government. And that, you know, that I think is a history in some countries where it's gone wrong. You, you're seeing bad mining practices. You're seeing uh, money not funneled to the government, but to politicians in those countries. And from there, probably directly funneled straight out of the country. So that, that money is not hitting the ground. It's going elsewhere. And I think that's what we really need to focus on is making sure that, um, you know, the, the agreements with governments are transparency. The money is actually going into the government coffers and not into people's own, own pockets. Um, and that's about stamping out corruption and, and looking at ethical supply chains and that type of thing. I think that's really important for the future. And you mentioned earlier about the fact that mining companies do have a lot of good stories that they just don't tell. And as a result, um, 
shoot themselves in the foot. How can the mining companies tell their good stories, the employment they generate, the uh, allied businesses that exist because of the operations and so on and so forth? I mean, um, how, how can they tell their stories effectively? Yeah, I think I feel that a lot of the industry in Australia and in Africa, uh, they feel very browbeaten might be the word, you know, by a lot of this, you know, the media around mining is bad or pollution or whatever. But there are positive stories to tell and, and they need to get on the front foot. And as I mentioned here, the Chamber of Men Minerals and Energy in Western Australia has just employed an ex-marketing person. They're looking at very much getting on the front foot, telling their good stories, sponsoring mainstream, um, mainstream community projects, being much more part of the community rather than hidden away. Um, I think it's time to, you know, people to step up and be proud of the industry and tell those good stories. Uh, and that's part of, you know, a group such as AMIG, that's part of our, our job is to do that. Um, sure, there's still, uh, you know, you're still going to get negative press, you're still going to get opposition, but it's important for us to stand up and say, no, we're, we're proud of this industry. We have seen all these things that we've done well and um, proud, proud to be stand up and counted. Uh, and I see, you know, the sort of work that you do, Philip, through Africa Pod is, is, is fantastic. Really getting videos, um, getting in media channels that not every, you know, the traditional ones of television and newspaper are obviously a lot smaller than they used to be. So you need to get onto people's phones and on their iPads and laptops um, and keep telling those good stories. And then hopefully you'd see the good examples being held up and people say, well, that's great. And look at that, that mining development. It's been good for that town. It's caused employment, created employment. They've built a new hospital. They've got an airport. Um, you know, that's the sort of stories we want to see. Shared prosperity. Yeah, shared prosperity and lifting people generally up out of, uh, out of you know, getting a better quality of life. I mean, I, you know, even here in Australia, I could see... When I was a kid, we all lived in very small houses, no air conditioning, dirt floors sometimes. Out, you know, people were living in tin sheds out where I was. Most people wouldn't believe that. I mean, yeah. I've had a chance to go to places like Norseman and um, other, you know, surrounding country areas in WA, and then it doesn't actually look or feel like Australia uh, because Australia would be looked at from the eyes of Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth, Sydney, etc. But so it's interesting what you just said. Yeah. So, but yeah, if you go back into those areas now, you know, those people, sometimes the houses are a bit the same, but they do have internet, they have uh, air conditioners, um, you know, there might be three cars parked out of the front of the house. And then, you know, the hospital down the road is, 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 is a better quality. And so, you know, it's definitely in Australia, we have had an, in, you know, an increase in the quality of life it might not be too noticeable, um, but certainly a lot of that has been underpinned by the mining industry and you know, and also the agricultural industry to a, to a, to a degree. Um, and you know, we in the mining industry have seen the benefits that we've got out of it in Australia, for example, and we think that those things can be applied to um, to Africa as well. It can be a win-win. And uh, I noticed that AMEG, you do organize what's called the monthly sundowner, which is more of a, a casual gathering of uh, your members to network, to talk. Um, how did that idea come about and how is it going so far? Yeah, it's going great. The idea came around last year and one of our members, uh, Brian Rudd from Capital Drilling, mentioned that there was, we were talking about sundowners and we, he said, oh, London's got one. I think it's the third Thursday of every month. And he said that's quite good because it's what they're for is really people that do travel and when they come back to town, it's a place they can gather and swap stories and go back out again. I think Singapore also has a mining club that has a monthly one. And then he said, well, why, doesn't, you know, why don't we have one in Perth? So we actually picked a Thursday, which we picked as the first Thursday of the month um, for that sort of thing. And not just for AMIG members, but for anybody related to the mining industry, generally in, you know, that does work overseas. And, you know, the numbers have grown really well. And I think it's, it's a camaraderie, it's part of camaraderie thing, but also just a great way to, to meet people and hear what's going on. You know, it's really important. We get swamped so much, I think, now with social media and, and email feeds and that type of thing. People more than ever value that face-to-face -face and hearing those stories. And, you know, often things come out which... You just wouldn't get online. You're still hearing those little bits of information that really could make a difference to your company or to a prospect you're looking at. Yeah, so I think the Sundowners 
uh, there's there's a real need there still for that connection and that's filled it. And the other thing with a sundowner is all our other events tend to be learning events. People sit down for a while and they, they listen and they question and answers. The sundowners are, are, are purely just chatting and networking. Um, and sometimes people like that, they just want to have a chat and relax. And um, looking at where you're heading then as AMEG in terms of the future, how, what path, the path you see ahead, what is it like? Oh, well, I think for us, we want to grow. I think I, I did say before, you know, looking to do more policy work, but certainly still grow. Um, we have a lot of inquiries from, from, you know, Middle East as well. You know, companies working in the Middle East or even in New Guinea where they have the same issues, really. Um, they're not in Australia, but they're Australia-based. They're, they're working in another country, how, how they best do that. Um, so there's growth is there. I certainly want to... Um, push through some of our policy pieces and one of those areas is like an artisanal mining. Artisanal mining is a very complex area where there's really no group in the world looking at it on a, on a global basis and one thing we want to do next year is have a artisanal mining working group uh, with um, uh, through the Voluntary Principles Initiative which is a worldwide group and, and other groups such as the World Bank and United Nations. Um, and looking at deals, uh, things around artisanal mining, because there are things there that, that are really concerning. Um, you know, the, the workplaces are, are unsafe. A lot of the gold is not declared and smuggled out of the country. Um, they're using um, quite nasty chemicals, cyanide and mercury and those types of things, which really, if you want to have a, a sophisticated, healthy um, mining industry, I think artisanal mining needs to be addressed. Um, and these aren't e easy things to fix. Um, but we certainly want to be involved in, in that. So that's a key policy area. Also around security is also very important. Um, and again, just really reiterating that importance of your social license to operate and make sure that companies have all the tools they need to, um, to plan and execute really good, really good programs around their minds and making sure that they're, they're engaging with the community and putting back into those, those communities and those countries they operate in. Well, William, it's a pleasure talking to you, and I certainly wish uh, AMEG the very best uh, in everything it does. In you know the uh, the flow and effect is good for the business community. Mm. Thank no, you. Thanks, Philip. Really appreciate the opportunity. Not enough of that interview. Not a problem. There is more on African Pod Business Forum. You can check out our audio podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever else you listen to your podcast. And for more thoughtful conversations, subscribe to African Pod Business Forum here on our YouTube channel. <laughs>